Tony Wright, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> now, you've got a theory about the human brain that's based on evidence from a lot of different fields, such as anatomy, anthropology, and also things like observing behavioral uh, traits in people today and examining ancient texts, lots of different fields. And part of what you found is that we know there was a period where the human brain was expanding, but that appears to have stopped some time ago. And since then, it's actually been in decline. Yeah, well, what what appears to be the, the case based on the evidence so far is, yes, there's a lot of interest, there has been for a long time, uh, in obviously the size, particularly of our the modern part of our brain, the neocortex, very, very large for our body size. And then from the fossil evidence, such as there is, it looks like there was a window of very rapid and accelerating expansion, which of course is fascinating because it's, it's very expensive to build neural tissue, it's very expensive to run. So we had this window of um, really rapid expansion um, over, the, the figures vary a little bit, but let's say over a couple of million years, uh, roughly tripled in size. So that's a huge thing, at least in every other species that has been looked at, this is a really massive thing. What what has been getting less attention, uh, there's a little bit more recently, but uh, obviously caught my eye quite early on, the expansion, fascinating what's causing that, um, but also why the expansion stalled, interesting in itself. And in fact, it looks like, um, the evidence is building all the time, it looks like there's been a significant shrinkage of our brain, um, certainly in recent times, the last few tens of thousand years, possibly going back maybe 200,000 years, certainly looks like at least the end of the expansion. So I think these are equally significant. It's exciting to look at why things have expanded, but it's also, I would have thought, equally important to figure out why that expansion stalled and why there's been a shrinkage. And, and then, of course, that goes into what impact has that had on us. Yeah, and I was maybe going to discuss <clears throat> those traits with you about how we live in a very, what people would describe as left-brained world where it helps to be a psychopath. I mean, <laughs> if you score low on the psychopath test, you've got to wonder how well am I going to do in the business world and stuff. But actually, people are aware that we're in a very left-brained society. So maybe the better thing to talk about of interest is like why um, the human brain expanded and how that happened and this unique symbiosis we seem to have with fruit because before reading your book I thought lots of animals had the same relationship with fruit that we did. Well it, many we could obviously go in many directions and I'd like to think all these things are connected you yeah. talk about the the world we inhabit today well in many ways that is my greatest interest um, you know why it is we're behaving in such a self-destructive self-harming way um, but really to get at that I was interested in the history or the clues in our origins and I'm very convinced there are in fact I think it's it's very clear once you start asking the right questions looking at what appears to make us somewhat unique according to you know what a lot of people think um, obviously our large brain this the speed it expanded but the traits that's given us um, or at least some of us anyway and the kind of traits we we like to associate with being human um, particularly things like uh, high cognitive function, we consider ourselves to be very intelligent, um, things like empathy, compassion, what is it that facilitates that, what is it that drives that, what is it that allows us to do things that are very um, different to that, so the aggression, the fear, the control, and you know, that, that ending up in wars and so on. So looking at these traits, uh, I, I, it, it struck me, well, what is it, if anything, what is it that's unique in our origins, in our evolution? that could offer an explanation. Um, so in pondering these things, um, one of the most obvious things that crops up, I think, is um, is our archaic, our ancestral relationship with the tropical forests. It's generally read, and it's certainly in primatology, anthropology, uh, is a fair, well, a very high degree of consensus that we spent a very, very long period of time living in the forests, in the tropical forest uh, in Africa. Um, and beyond that, um, it wasn't just that we were living in the tropical forests, which are known to be uh, biochemically the richest ecology we know of, we so far discovered. Again, an interesting fact, I think. Um, but it was our specific relationship with the forest. Um, it's generally termed, 
a symbiotic relationship that's in the literature. It's not discussed hugely, um, but it's it, it's a symbiotic relationship with the with the the tropical forest trees in in such that we were eating the fruit of the trees or eating a lot of fruit. We have a again generally acknowledged in scientific circles. Um, we have a frugivorous anatomy. Um, that's something that comes from our time in the forest, and we were eating fruit. And the basic idea is a bit like uh, the way insects pollinate flowers. Uh, again, it's part of the plant's sexual reproduction. So they put on a show. They've got these big, gaudy flowers. Well, that's actually part of the sexual apparatus of the flowering plants. They produce a, a free lunch in the form of nectar. And the insects come along. They drink the nectar and carry away the pollen, which is equivalent of mammalian sperm, and take it to another a flower and, 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 you know, very basic sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, and it's shaped, of course, it's shaped the flowers, it's shaped the insects um, to the point where you get examples where there are insects that are specific to one type of plant. Oh, okay. So you, you end up over time with potentially very close relationships. They yeah. effectively become the same species. And that's, that is part of the definition of symbiosis, a very en entangled symbiotic relationship where you have uh, two organisms, two species, eventually the lines blur or they can blur and you're effectively talking about a single organism. And that, as I say, that can happen with insects. Um, so you have an insect entirely dependent on a plant and vice versa. Well, if one of those dies out, so does the other. So we're talking very, very close relationships. And I think, um, and the evidence supports this, humans had, and, and a lot of our ancestral relatives um, and some of the living relatives still have that kind of relationship where we were um, part of the plant's reproductive cycle in that we were disseminating the seeds and what the plants did to encourage this uh, they effectively uh, their sex organs swelled up and they were pumped full of all sorts of chemicals and again similar to the insects very sweet and that was kind of the, the reward. We were taking this stuff, eating it, and disseminating the seeds around the forest. And obviously, the plants that produced the most attractive or beneficial uh, rewards would do better in terms of reproducing. So, you know, very, very basic mechanism, very well understood. Um, what it occurred to me, um, and it seems to be generally absent from the literature, is that this relationship was potentially much, much more deeply entangled than simply eating something and taking the seeds away. Well, that's correct. Um, I think you have to step back and look at exactly what fruit is. Okay. And um, my background's more about plant sciences and botany, so it's something I, I have a basic understanding of, whereas a lot of people, even in the kind of scientific community, they tend to see fruit as a, yes, yeah, something you can eat, it's a healthy snack or whatever it is. But actually, in a, at a more scientific level, it, it is the sex organ of the plant. It's effectively, for the most part, it's the female reproductive organ. And if you know a little bit about reproduction and how how that's such an important mechanism in whatever species, plant or animals, and it, it it's about radically different environment to the normal environment, but the molecular environment, the hormone environment, uh, in the same way, for example, that humans, the mammalian uterus, it provides a radically different environment for the developing fetus. Well, same with plants. Plants' reproductive organ provides a radically different environment. So really, what we're looking at is a swollen reproductive organ we're ingesting it and I, one of the ways i've started looking at this instead of thinking about eating um fruit take that a step further while well, you're ingesting eating the sex organs of the plant that becomes interesting taking this step further again if you specialize if you become a specialized fruit eater let's say you're eating 50 60 70 maybe more 80 percent of your diet is fruit and you have access to it every day then rather than thinking about eating the fruit you can begin to think about actually you're putting yourself in that reproductive environment. You're putting with this biochemistry flooding through your system all the time. Effectively, I know it's not quite the same, but effectively you're, you're putting yourself in that reproductive environment. And as far as I can tell, that's, that's correct. It's just a very different way of looking at it. 
So yeah, that's what I struggled with to get um, because I think somebody could think, therefore, if I think you described it as you're effectively in a kind of uh, plant uterus, really. It's like it's like that. It's like taking a fertilized egg and putting it in the uterus of a sheep. It's a bit like that. And I think um, people may uh, read this and at first glance think, so if you have a diet of small mammals, does that mean you're effectively in a small mammal kingdom uterus? But the difference is that the chemicals in meat don't alter your body, do they? The chemicals in leaves or grasses, they don't add anything and what plant what fruit seems to have done with its complex cocktail of chemicals because it's the sex organ of the plant is add something massively profound to our anatomy that actually defines who we are in, in an almost frightening way really because it's so weird well it, it's it's one of the most powerful ways to change the structure and physiology of an organism is to mess around with its develop you know its reproductive environment where it's developing the sort of embryonic and fetal and early development stages um, and j just picking up on what you said um, I think a lot of things do affect us but only by degrees relatively small amounts um, it'd be different if we specialized in eating the sex organs of other mammals or something that that might have an impact I would suggest it wouldn't do us any good and I mean people do eat those kind of things because yeah. we're just recycling mammalian hormones um, what I think sort of jumps out when you think about this is that ingesting the the sex organs of the plants that's you know hormonally the most powerful part of the plant and when I say hormonally they're hormonally active compounds a lot of them are described as they're not considered hormones in the mammalian sense but they play the same role in plants and they clearly have a hormonal effect on us yeah. um so that is the key thing that stood out. It, it, yes, you eat the leaves, you eat all sorts of stuff, and it will have some limited effect. But eating the sex organs of a, a completely other species, well, in this case, by our own description, a whole other kingdom. So your, your idea, I th think it's, it's something we, we've discussed, this idea of taking a, you know, a, a, a human embryo and putting it in a sheep's uterus or a, or a different animal's uterus, that would be seen as quite bizarre, dangerous, and it's going to cause all sorts of weird things. Well, what about taking it to a whole other kingdom and, as I say, effectively putting it in the reproductive environment of the flowering plants? Uh, and and I, I say the reproductive environment of the flowering plants because I'm probably going to talk singular. It makes it easier, but it, would, it was possibly 50, 100, 150 different species or more based on current observations. So we were flooding our system with the combined reproductive environment of all these species of flowering plants. And again, as I said earlier, the most biochemically complex species we know already, and they're putting all that chemical complexity into their own reproductive environment for their own evolutionary kind of reasons. And that's what we've tapped into and right. again, immersed ourselves in. So according to basic kind of genetics and how you read the genes how you read the dna and turn it into structure that's like that's like taking the, the human genome taking it out of the environment that we presume it's evolved in our own environment and putting it in some kind of alien environment and yeah. then expecting it to turn out the same well of course it's not going to yeah so um because there's this cocktail of chemicals what it seems to have done is impose upon us a really profound change in our brain whereas if you're eating meat or grass or whatever the testosterone I think there's that kind of thing in meat it may affect your behavior in a certain way but it's not effectively transforming you this fruit from what I gather <laughs> has been kind of making us get better and better almost like it's um, giving us a whole new direction of development and it's adding something what exactly has fruit done to the brain um, well, I, I think there's several things. Um, the area I'm particularly interested in is the hormonal effect, um, because again, that's an in, again very well understood, very well accepted um, that it's the hormones that read the DNA. You know, we, there's so much written about DNA since its discovery, and a lot of focus on changes in the DNA code, and that's part of how evolutionary theory works. And I, and I don't have a problem with that. I think it's a very good theory. But there's a completely different way of changing the way uh, 
um, you get a, a sort of different result out of the DNA, and that's just changing the way it's being read. Uh, okay. So the the idea is, um, if you're putting the human genome, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about us collectively um, in this radically different um, hormonally active environment. It's going to have a, it's going to have an impact. Um, the question is, what kind of impact? Well, I think stepping back and again, just looking at it very simplistically, um, we're, what we're talking about here is the female reproductive system of the plants um, and that certainly as far as the plants go that's a, that's again a fairly or a very unique environment it's a kind of juvenile maintaining or inducing environment it's, it's, it's sort of evolved to deal with the very embryonic form of the plants um, and in, in simplistically looking at it well what happens if you put a, a piece of DNA or a, a human the human genome in an environment that's going to be juvenile inducing um, and it's also a feminizing environment it is the female environment well that initially might sound like some kind of hippie philosophy it's like oh yeah this is cool you got this female reproductive system you put the human species in there wait a few million years and see what comes out the other end although I think that's what happened um, obviously you then have to ponder well actually does this make any sense but when you start looking at the the sort of pharmacology and the biochemistry of fruit Lo and behold, it's spot on. It does exactly that. Um, it's loaded. Uh, these these kind of reproductive organs systems are loaded with um, hormonally active compounds that do a whole range of things very powerfully. One of the key things they do is they dilute and compete with um, our own mammalian hormones. Okay. Things like estrogens and testosterone and we already know they're incredibly powerful very necessary and integral part of our development and they they play an incredibly powerful almost disproportionately powerful role in the development of our brain the structure of our brain and things like um windows of um oh they're called developmental windows so for example how long our denial period is which is the window we need to grow a big brain in the first place and the the effect appears to be by dampening down our own steroids these um, hormones i've mentioned testosterone estrogen reducing their activity it it prolongs the period when we're still in this juvenile form and i think what happened um, is exactly that. It's it, it sort of began extending the period of our juvenility, and eventually, even by the time we were reaching sexual maturity later and later, it even diluted that process. So, so we didn't we didn't reach sexual maturity quite as or, or such a, a sexually mature form, um, and we, that stayed with us all our lives. And of course, the interesting thing for me is, well, what impact would that have on our brain? Yeah, that is fascinating because we know that um, if you have a long period before your uh, you go through puberty, that I think you might have said this already, but just to hammer it home, it um, allows your brain plasticity and it can therefore develop uh, more intelligence, a, a more complex brain. And the idea that you would then have um, this plasticity after puberty or a longer period of juvenility is uh, crucial to increased intelligence, isn't it? Well, I, I certainly, I think there's a correlation um, between size and intelligence. It, it's it, it, it's not all about the size, but I think the mechanism that was driving the expansion of our brain is very important, um, and particularly the structure. And I think that's the key bit here. Um, a, a juvenile brain, I mean, the, in a very general way, this the standard mammalian brain it goes through these windows, you have this juvenile phase, and it looks like, and certainly a lot of species, if not most species, that window, that juvenile window, um, is the period where you can learn, acquire a lot of knowledge, uh, information. It, it, it's, a, it's a much more plastic sort of window. And I guess for most species, it seems to work along the lines of, you know, whether you're nurtured by your parents depending on the species or if you're left to fend for yourself you have this window where you learn stuff um and that might be for months might be for a few years at most in, in most mammals 
Um, and then as the hormone regime changes and, and starts turning you into an adult so you can reproduce, which is, again, integral part of the kind of standard theory of evolution and part of it's about reproducing more and reproducing more. So when that, when that begins to change, one of the key things that changes, of course, is the structure of your brain. Um, that in turn affects everything else. But what it seems to do is, as the brain matures, as it becomes more adult, it loses this plasticity. It loses okay. this capacity yeah. to learn new stuff, to, to, to interact real time. It's running on programs it's learned. Now, that's clearly very effective. It's a very yeah. effective strategy. Many, many species have survived for apparently for millions of years using that strategy. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, however, it's going to severely limit um, your capacity to engage real time, particularly if you live a long time. What you learn in your first few years is all you've got. Yes, yeah. Uh, so I, when you add this relationship with fruit, the sex organs, the female sex organs of plants, um, what it opens up the door to, I think, is an ex extending window of juvenility. And beyond that, a sort of dampening down of the maturation process. So the process that would turn us into adults, uh, we become uh, sexually mature, we can reproduce. And incidentally, and I'll touch on this later, I'm just going to throw this in now. It's also that effectively when we start aging, so anybody mm -hmm. interested yeah. in longevity, that's, you know, <laughs> we don't really age when we're a juvenile. We're still growing and everything's developing. That's um, the thing that's going to get people. They'll be like, I don't care about intelligence. Just want to well, know. Well, I know. And I, I've seen this rather late. It's always been there. I've been more interested in our psychology, but so many people are interested in not wanting to die and stuff. <laughs> I think we were, I think we were locked into a mechanism that actually did give us extreme longevity. We're all, we're already very long lived yeah. as a species generally anyway, but I think it, it probably went on a lot longer simply because this relationship with fruit was preventing us from reaching maturity. It slowed the process down, so we had this increasing window of juvenility. But even as we approached maturation, that process was diluted, and we ended up being partially juvenile for the rest of our lives. Um, we never reached this fully mature state. And I think that's the key. It sounds almost... Um, counterintuitive but it's actually the fact that we've we now more fully mature and more quickly that loses this unique plastic structure that we had as children or we had in this ancestral period um, simply because of the effects of fruit at least primarily that's what was driving it um, so I think it, this is mostly about um, maintaining a juvenile state and it's in the literature again this is one these are one of the unique areas that, that have been picked up on by many researchers that humans and some of our living relatives display juvenile traits into adulthood. Okay. What, what kind of things? Um, well, some of, the, some of the things that are discussed as, as possible candidates for this um, is our flat, more juvenile face. It's, we don't have a sort of protruding face. Um, that's, that's one area. Um, the, the fact that we do mature later, um, yeah. so that late maturation, although again, as you, as you probably well know, that's changing even as we watch, we're yes, watching yeah. the age of sexual maturity drop before our eyes, which is very scary. If this is central to providing us with a highly intelligent brain, we're yeah. losing that window. Um, some people have talked about our nakedness being a juvenile trait. When I say nakedness, that the hairless, I mean, we're not really hairless. We just have very, very fine hairs. They don't they don't form into this much thicker hair. Um, is there a state of uh, a state of being that is like juvenile behaviour amongst great apes and? Humans? Well, I, I think you see it in a lot of species, and and clearly in humans as well. It, it's often seen in slight, or it can be couched in slightly negative language sometimes. But it's it's that more childlike state. It's that kind of innocence, curiosity, empathy, playfulness, um, insatiable appetite for novelty and uh, learning and new ideas, and just generally having a nice time and not being, not being <laughs> sort of locked into, you know, more adult ways of thinking. And, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've grown up in times where, you know, we, it's almost you can't wait to become an adult because that's when things get really cool. Well, it could be back to front. We could have lost some of those 
or a lot of those psychological traits, plus a lot of other traits that we don't even know about anymore, particularly to do with high cognitive function and our ability to keep learning as we get older. Um, those are the traits that I would say we've been losing because of this breakdown in the relationship with fruit. Yeah, I see. So, so effectively, we mature, we reach puberty, and then that's us finished as an article, and then you reproduce as that thing. And you don't learn profoundly new stuff after puberty, like how to walk and talk and all that kind of thing. It's harder to learn languages. You're very much reliant on what you have already before puberty. But... Um, you know, I, I've read in your book that the relationship we had with plants uh, changed the brain in a way. And am I right in thinking that part of it remains protein after puberty? And that's quite a unique thing in humans. Yes, I think it still does, although I think we've lost a lot of that as well. I think that's the very thing we're losing. I think that was much more the whole picture at one time, going going back when we were still part of this symbiotic relationship. Um I think the new brain that emerged was effectively a juvenile brain uh, th through the influence of the plants, the female reproductive organ of plants. It was changing our juvenile window. It was allowing us longer to grow this brain. We didn't need a brain just like that to survive. Clearly, no species needs a brain this large to survive. So it's got nothing to do with survival, regardless of what a lot of people talk about. Was, you could almost see it as a fortuitous accident, if such okay. things exist. Um, so I think this relationship was, uh, was changing those developmental windows at least a little bit. That was allowing a longer period for our brain to, to grow, to proliferate. And it was under uh, this hormone modified regime so the new brain that was growing wasn't the same as the arcadian brain that we already had and i'd go as far as to say what began to emerge was an increasingly juvenile layer of brain on top of the old brain so we had this as you've already described the kind of standard idea is you know quickly get to maturity reproduce mm -hmm. we're, we're just the vehicle for the next generation and that's pretty much how it works the sort of standard theory of evolution and competition quick you can reproduce more you can reproduce that's a good thing um well I, I think the sort of intervention of this relationship began to change all that um and it, as i say that it, it facilitated the emergence of a new kind of brain and again I, in some kind of ironic twist, it was an increasingly juvenile layer of neural tissue. Um, and being that it was sort of growing upwards and outwards, effectively encasing the older brain in this new layer, um, and the evidence supports this, that the outer layer, as, as the brain expands, it's, it's, it's the ever-moving outer layer that's the executive layer. It has the final say. doesn't even mean that we're not utilizing the, the all elements of the brain. It's all you know, at one time all working harmoniously together, but increasingly juvenile layer emerging. And that's obviously going to change our psychology, our behavior. But it's yeah. also the brain also runs their own hormone system. Well, well this okay. is what I'm talking about when I say, like, you know, people may think, what, what's so special about fruit? Because uh, all, all plants have some hormones in them, all uh, meat. But you eat meat or grass or leaves or whatever, and it may affect your behavior. It may do small things like that. And it will, but effectively, uh, most of what it's doing is just maintaining what you have. It's keeping what you have and maybe changing your tiny bit. So we got into this symbiotic relationship with plants. And during that period where we were eating it all the time, non-seasonal fruit, um, it's imposed a new <laughs> neocortex onto us, which, as you say, is the executive layer, which means, isn't it, like, this is how it defines how we perceive reality. It defines who we are. So that really shows you uh, how much of a reproductive environment eating these fruits puts us into, because it's given us a whole new consciousness, and it seems to be expansive. It seems to be taking us somewhere. Well, well, yeah, I, I think what it did was was not only keep the door open, probably opened it a lot wider, this this window that, that is common to certainly a lot of mammalian species, maybe all, this this window I've already touched on of, of great degree of plasticity, um, different psychology. It's not it's not just humans. You know, you, you look around wild animals, um, the adults less so you know, classic old dog new tricks. But yeah. the young of of many species are inherently playful. Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of it is life skills and whatever, but they're still very playful. 
Um, and I, I think in humans, we still see that, you know, obviously in children and this great capacity to learn. Well, if, if we retain that, we retain those traits, not only longer, but into adulthood and ultimately and our lives were longer as well for the very same reasons, then it totally, it, it doesn't just change the things a little bit. You're talking about, you know, it's, it's almost like an alien species <laughs> emerging that, that runs contrary to all our thinking and understandably so for the most part that, you know, it, it, the idea that this could have happened, let's say, in a hostile environment where there's big predators on the savannah, the kind of classic ideas, it's insane. It, it, yeah. it's, like, it's like taking, you know, um, a current form, maybe a tribal culture that do live in those environments have learned how to survive very eff effectively wiping their memories clean and, and, and saying, yeah, you, you're now like um, eight-year-old kids, go and have some fun on the savannah. Yes. That's not going to last very long because you're going to be, <laughs> you know, instantaneously. However, in the deep tropical forest, you know, you've got the tropical forest and then deep within that you've got this non-seasonal sort of niche. So you, you could have a forest boundary, certainly when the forests are at the most expansive phase of hundreds of miles, if not even thousands of miles, certainly hundreds of miles, where there aren't, first of all, you don't get grass. Why is that important? Because you need grass to support big herds, the grass-eating herds. And what do you get with that? You get the big predators. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have that in the forest. It's not okay, that there are yeah. no predators. There are very, very few. In Africa, currently, the only major predator that I'm aware of is the leopard. It will hunt in the deep forest. But even chimpanzees are seen to group together and defend themselves. Oh, so right. I think an intelligent biped certainly working collectively if we, if we can it's generally accepted we can survive on the savannah i don't have any problem with that humans yeah. are highly adaptive highly intelligent we can survive in all sorts of hostile environments so the idea that we couldn't uh, live in the forest and deal with the relatively minor threats there you know i think it's a relatively benign environment but it would have facilitated this regression it's maybe yeah. not the best word to use but you know regressing to a more childlike state but bringing with it phenomenal traits and abilities that we just wouldn't have and, and virtually no other mammals have. We, we see glimpses of it in the other apes and then possibly in, in totally different sort of um, species for very different reasons, um, but it's very rare. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's what was unique in this environment. Well, how many species have this relationship, this perpetual over evolutionary timescale relationship with the sex organs, not only of another species, a whole other kingdom. Now, if that's not extremely unique, and and again, it's in the data. It's not like anybody's arguing about this. Okay, so, and yet so this is uh, this is obsession. Oh, what what caused all this? Let's look on the savanna. Let's look on the coast. Let's yeah. look at hunting or tools or fire or what? No, no, no. You've already got an extraordinary, unique relationship. And as long as the forest's stable, that can go on for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. It seems to me what you're describing is a difference between you're either in protection mode or growth mode. And I've always found that theory that meat made the brain grow big flawed on so many levels. Because for a start, we know the body doesn't process meat that well. If you eat Atkins style, you lose weight. Um, and in order to eat uh, to hunt you needed the intelligence in the first place to make tools to hunt so like you must have built the intelligence up already by the time you caught the first animal but also what you're saying now is like if you're on the the savannah what if you're hunting for things you're also then at risk of being hunted and so you must spend a lot of time in protection mode and and looking out for yourself and it doesn't sound like a an environment where juvenility would work at all and although uh you know we see it as um a negative state in a way because you're kind of helpless when you're juvenile in an environment where you don't need to fight constantly juvenility could be a brilliant thing because it's that window of growth isn't it it it's it seems like a possible contradiction and it, it might be hard for us to get our heads around it initially because I'm not suggesting we stop growing at eight years old and that's, that was the end of it. I'm saying we, we pulled some of those traits through mm -hmm. in, into a more mature size. We still grew, um, but we retained some of those psychological and hormonal traits that allowed us 
to, for well f- certainly facility even forced our brain to grow bigger whether we liked it or not but obviously that increasingly juvenile new brain was allowing us a very different perception very different psychology the idea is the new brain was once that kind of got a foothold and began to expand under the influence of fruit it began to feed into this mechanism by pumping more juvenile hormone regime so it's kind of starts fueling its own expansion completely and essentially underpinned by the fruit that you know we're talking about a symbiotic relationship here remember uh, and this is where i think you know I, uh, I possibly mentioned this example before um thinking of symbiotic relationships um a lot of people will be familiar with lichen yes i have heard see, this see it hanging off the trees in 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 damp forests this kind of stuff well it's a classic example uh, where you have a fungi and an algae that have formed a symbiotic relationship um or many different kinds of symbiotic relationship and the sum of the parts is radically different um you know the the, the structure and ability of the lichen to survive in many different environments is greater than the individual components and and that that's that's perfectly normal in symbiotic relationships well if you apply that thinking to our symbiotic relationship with plants and once you start to recognize that yeah, it wasn't just eating some fruit and spraying some seed i mean yes it was but there's a hell of a lot more went on there again you have to reframe how you think about this so you're ingesting this reproductive biochemistry 24/7 for millions of years and over time that becomes an increasingly entangled relationship and what begins to emerge this is the point whatever emerges from that relationship you can quite legitimately say you know it, it's an emerging property of the symbiosis or it's effectively a plant animal hybrid now i'm particularly yeah. here talking about our neocortex you know uh, i think most of us grown up with the idea that you know aren't humans clever and we yeah we 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 kind of research ourselves as an autonomous being perfectly understandable it works for most species and yet in the literature it's already accepted we had this long symbiotic phase so we kind yeah. of i- ignore all the implications of that and look at our own genome you know we have the human genome project and i think uh, a, lo- a lot of expectations that we're going to find amazing dna code there that's going to explain how we're so amazing and clever well actually it turns out the human genome is your typical mammalian genome there's nothing particularly special going on there um and you know again all that build up and then not enough not an awful lot of talking about well actually why isn't the genome explaining why we've got such a huge brain etc yeah. etc but we know from changing transcription environments and symbiotic relationships you can end up with radically different results not by changing the genome but by changing how it's read and that's exactly what i think went on with our relationship with fruit over millions of years i in fact i can't i i can't imagine a mechanism i've never seen any evidence of a mechanism where you can take a species take a genome put it in an alien reproductive environment and it not completely change everything that's, you know yeah. it, it's just not possible by any understanding we had so once you elucidate the known pharmacology and mechanisms it points strongly to a juvenile inducing and maintaining environment a feminizing environment it reduces the masculinization process which is particularly relevant to male brains and how they change radically at puberty and mm-hmm. of course then affect the rest of everything we've created because you know males have come to dominate our, our culture well if all that um had radically changed in the forest and then the forest disappeared which can happen forests um tropical forests can be stable for millions of years but ultimately if the climate dries severely enough and the evidence supports this from pollen records and all the rest of it you can get catastrophic shrinkage of even tropical forest um and the evidence suggests that may well have happened at various about, times what about the flood idea is there could that have been a possibility uh i i i think the mythology around floods may well have a basis in reality obviously people are looking at this but as far as i'm concerned it's much too recent it it, it may have you know i i think there's people talking about potential comet or asteroid impacts on the yeah, on the yeah. ice caps uh, or tidal waves or uh, all that's fascinating stuff but i think that's at a much later epoch okay. uh, um mm-hmm. um i but the uh, the environment does naturally shrink at sometimes anyway then does it 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 dries up 
Well, cli- climate, you know, there's all this debate on climate change at the minute, and, and there's no doubt there are natural cycles with the climate, or, or very little doubt. It certainly looks from the evidence that you, you have um, significant oscillations, uh, partly due to tectonics, the plates moving, the ocean currents changing, and then within that, the sun activity, and lots of factors. Um, how that impacts, uh, or what's particularly relevant to our evolution, if we were dependent on the reproductive organs of the forest, would be wetter and drier periods. Right, yeah. And again, tropical forests can be pretty stable. They'll, you know, they'll pump water inland. They'll, to some degree, generate their own weather. So, so, so they'll shrink and expand a bit as the climate changes, um, but they're fairly stable. Of course, if you get extreme drying, where it really, you know, really starts to bite, then the forest can begin to shrink. And as it shrinks, it loses its capacity to produce more humidity and you know, you end up with this kind of yeah. runaway drying sort of thing. Um, and again, the fossil, the sort of fossil po- pollen record and other indicators suggest that's, a f- if not uh, frequent, it's certainly regular over evolutionary timescales. That kind of thing does happen in areas that are currently now wet tropical forest. The evidence suggests that various times it was um, woodland, savanna, even semi-arid. So, you know, right. we know these can be quite severe changes. And I think particularly interesting with the African tropical forests, um, you know, you need a certain amount of rainfall to maintain an, in, in an equatorial climate, a warm climate to induce and maintain a tropical forest. Well, the African rainfall generally, it's certainly sufficient to create and maintain tropical forests, but it's not as not as plentiful as it say in the Asian or South American tropical forests. The African tropical forests are more susceptible potentially to drying out. Uh, so it's interesting if our evolutionary origins are there, and we were dependent on tropical forests. We we may well have been dependent on one of the more fragile tropical forest eco- ecologies. Um, and if that did start severely shrinking due to drying, and again the evidence suggests that's happened on more than one occasion, and some of them have been very severe, you end up where your how can I put this, the mechanism that's facilitating and maintaining your consciousness system, your neural system, becomes the Achilles heel. Okay. Normally we think of them as stable, but once in a, once in a, you know, an evolutionary blue moon, they can disappear or virtually disappear to the point where that symbiotic relationship isn't going to be sustained anymore. The break is going to happen. We're not going to have this reproductive um, biochemistry flooding through our system, plus all the other cool stuff that comes with fruit. I mean, I'm mostly focused on the hormonal impact, but fruit also provides simple sugars. Well, you need simple sugars to run yes. your brain, and you need more of them if you've got a big brain, so it's a really cool relationship. It, they're loaded with antioxidants. Well, again, if you have a big brain, any brain needs protection because it's highly volatile fatty acids. If you're building a huge brain, it's a big headache. How are you going to protect it? Yeah. Not such a problem if you're flooding it 24-7 with loads of really powerful antioxidants. Um, But obviously the key one I'm interested in in terms of expansion is the hormonal impact. Well, if you lose that, um, you're going to be in trouble. Of course, if you've already grown a big juvenile neocortex, which depending on how long this relationship's been in place, you're going to have by degrees bigger or smaller neocortex and it's going to be running an increasingly juvenile system, it's not going to disappear overnight. Okay, it's, yeah. it's like it built this thing and it's still running. But by taking away the, the, the fruit element, it's it's not, it, it can't like, contain that expansion. It's, it's like, yeah. let's say you need, you know, you need 100% to move forward and the fruit makes up, initially it might make up 90% of the mechanism. Eventually, as, as the neocortex gets bigger, the fruit becomes less important hormonally, right. still very important for everything else. Um, but it's not going to be enough to maintain that expansion. So you start going into reverse each generation yeah. a little bit less, a little bit less. A bit like the expansion in reverse. So you get you get this, or looks like from the fossil record, this very slow increase. And it eventually begins to accelerate and then goes crazy. It really, really? accelerates okay. very quickly, yeah. Again, I think I mentioned the evidence so far suggests about a tripling in size in about two million years, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah. And again, that just on on the surface, that just doesn't like classic genetic selection. How on earth did that happen? And why haven't we found clear evidence in the genetic code? It's like, oh, yes, this is what caused it. Well, if you have a runaway feedback mechanism, that explains it very nicely. 
but of course it's potentially unstable. So you pull the plug on one of the key components and the mechanism starts to stall and it will go into reverse slowly at first, you know, the opposite, and eventually pick up speed as, as, our, as our juvenile neocortex begins to lose its juvenility it begins to produce a less juvenile neuroendocrine regime, mm-hmm. which will produce a less juvenile next generation, and so on it goes. Yeah. So, so you, you end up with this reversal where the shrinkage, which I think we see evidence of now, begins to expand, uh, but begins to accelerate, and, yeah, and well, we start losing more and more neural tissue. And more importantly, and I would say in many ways, it's the kind of neural tissue we have has changed. It's less and less juvenile. It's more and more adult. And you might think, well, yeah, that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, not if we've all the really cool traits that we aspire to have being human. We're in that juvenile phase. If we're losing that phase, then we're losing the very traits that we consider that make us human. When we're becoming more and more like a classic mammalian, you know, we're having more and more of a classic mammalian brain, which, again, typically is not so sharp. So we kid ourselves that we think we're still highly intelligent, tends to be hierarchical, tends to be aggressive. Not so much empathy, not so much compassion. Well, I think that's what we see around us. Yes, you really Uh, do. And it's almost as though you can see that uh, puberty and the stuff we do, the fact that we're not applying what we know, we know how to make tools, and we are increasingly getting better and better at how to make tools, but we're not putting it to any better use. In fact, we're just putting it to protective use constantly. If we're not protecting ourselves against another country, I think a lot of our technology is protecting our status, uh, our ability to get a mate. You have to sort of get it through the stuff you own, the material stuff you own. You, you certainly can't go out into the street with naked or just with the shirt on your back. And it, it all depends on technology. And you can see we're not evolving to protect our species at all, really. We're just doing it in a very piecemeal way. That I mean, everyone knows we're a bit mad <laughs> at the moment. But they seem quite resigned to it. And what I find really frightening is the fact, it, apparently, I don't know, you, you'd know better than I do, but I've read that we've lost a tennis ball's worth of brain in the past 30,000 years, which is just insane, and a golf ball's worth in the past 20,000. But, I mean, that, to me, is a staggering volume in you know, only a few thousand years. Mm. Well, uh, again, I think the volume is important, you know, back to the point I made size is relevant but it's more the structure really and if if the erosion of our neural tissue is going in in reverse directly in reverse which I suspect it is then w- what we when this relationship broke down what we'd lose first is the most sensitive most juvenile executive layer the outer layers they would be most susceptible to the the gradual return of our archaic steroid regime the classic mammalian steroid re- regime that that regime just doesn't allow that to happen it won't allow that extended maturation process and it will try and make that structure more adult more quickly because that's what it was designed to do and again yeah. very effective if you want to be a typical mammal if that's if what we survive, want yeah if yeah you if you just... if you simply want to survive and be a typical mammal we're heading in the perfect direction for that if you want to be something profoundly uniquely different that's the last thing you want. You want to maintain this juvenile window and keep it going for as long as you can. And I think, yeah, that's exactly what we've lost. And the volume is significant, very significant. But if 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 most of that volume, if not all of it's come from the outer layers, if, if the outer layers have just been shrinking away, then we've disproportionately been losing the most unique layers that we had in the past. They're what, yeah. They are what's gone first. And what's left has been turning... Uh, I've been forced to turn into more typical yeah. adult m- m- mammalian brain. I think, and we, we haven't touched on this yet, although it's it's obviously in other interviews and in the book and so on. Um, I think there's a twist in all of this, of course, um, in that the this process has been asymmetric, particularly the reversion, the sort of moving back towards a typical mammalian brain, in that one side of our brain, due to built-in genetic asymmetry. And again, that's a huge discussion now. Let's not bother with that. The evidence is good for that. Okay, Mammalian yeah. brains are genetically asymmetric. Um, what, it, what it means is if, if you change the hormone regime, you're going to get an asymmetric response. Who knows what that's going to be, but you're going to get an asymmetric response. One side's going to respond more quickly or differently to the other. And it looks like, or certainly my proposal would be, the left side of a brain, 
for whatever reason, it could have been the right, but the left side of our brain is much more sensitive to this re-emergence of an archaic steroid regime. And it's kind of regressing more quickly. It's turning into a more adult mammalian form more quickly. Um, and paradoxically, it's also become more dominant. So we, we've, we've become dominant, uh, we've become dominated by the least functional side of our brain, although it thinks it's the most clever side, as it would. It's classic, it's kind of catch-22. Yeah. As, as it's re-emerged, it thinks, it sees the world in, in more black and white, more hierarchy, more typical mammalian, and it doesn't have a problem. It's about aggression, it's about control, et cetera, et cetera, and wants more of that. So that's what, that's what started to re-emerge. We still have, I think, um, uh, again, due to this asymmetry, the right side of our brain still retains more of that juvenile layer. I, I don't think it's, um, I think it's also gone through this process, but to a lesser degree. So we still retain glimpses and elements of the, of the more juvenile neural architecture that can facilitate high plasticity, rapid real-time learning, playfulness, all, all those kind of things, empathy, compassion, and that's that's why we see that now. Humans are almost split. You know, we have our rational side and then we get glimpses or we have those feelings that come through from somewhere else. It's probably best exemplified in men where uh, it's partly culturally encouraged as well because we, you know, we live in a culture now that's, that's dictated to by left brain thinking. But men typically, certainly in our culture, struggle with emotions. You know, they they feel them and they try and push them away. Well, what's doing the pushing away and where do they live? You know, and <laughs> yet you find ways accidentally or otherwise, whether it's drinking some alcohol, doing some meditation, taking some drugs, whatever, and suddenly the floodgates can open. We still have that capacity, yeah. but not in our day-to-day -day lives. We're running on something much more sterile, much more cold, much more controlling. Um, it's a structural problem. It's not a choice, although we can choose to try and do something about it. Um, and locked away, we have this otherness, this other sense of self. And, it, you know, again, classically, we're, as men, certainly in this culture, we're encouraged to grow quickly, mm -hmm. not to show childlike emotions. You know, a lot of clues, even in our day-to-day -day language, you know, we're shutting the door on the very thing that actually gave us all these amazing abilities yeah. in the first place. So we still have relics of that. And that's where I think if this theory does pan out, I'm, I'm still hopeful. We all still have a lot of capacity locked away some of us have more access some of us less but it's still there um, and, and even if we can't figure out how to fix this problem overnight we can make choices we can start making informed decisions yeah. recognizing we have a serious problem and we know where we have at least some relics of our sanity and we yeah. can do things to access them of course, of course we, could choose, we could do that we can choose to become more logic, rational, shut that stuff away and, and look what's going on. It doesn't look very good. <laughs> and the thing that you're struggling with, presumably, is the fact that we are a left brain society who isn't necess who aren't necessarily open to new ideas in the scientific world. And so I think you've talked about <laughs> scientists producing these papers where they are explaining that how we delude ourselves and that you know, and then their conclusions mirror what they predict in their studies. And so how well this theory is received is crucial, really, because the key is knowing we have a problem and then we can work out how to do something about it. But it, it will be very difficult <laughs> convincing people that because of this sort of inbuilt thing. We're very set in our ways, aren't we? I think there is, a you know, it's several twists to this. And I think the percentage of, you know, I think this thing has a spectrum in our current state. There's a spectrum of how this r reversion to a more primitive mammalian brain is, is, is kind of manifest. Um, and it, it depends on the degree of hormonal, I'm going to call it damage, and also the degree of dominance between the hemispheres. And that does vary a lot. So I think at one end of the spectrum, you have people with a lot more sensitivity the intuition as we you know that's a word for something we don't understand but i'm just going to go with mm. these kind of left brain descriptions who are deeply traumatized because it's blatantly obvious that we're you know it's beyond self-harming it's 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 industrial scale self-destruction that's what yeah. we're engaged in you know the the very things that we're all in encouraged or even coerced to engage in certainly in western culture are the very things that are destroying us and destroying where we live i mean if that's not completely insane i don't know what is 
and a percentage of people can see that. And yeah. and as you move along the spectrum, some people need to be have that pointed out. Then they can see it. And then as you move further along, uh, more towards the kind of um, dominance by this not so bright, not so able to see context, etc. People are bulletproof deluded. They, they <laughs> are absolutely yeah. convinced that what we're doing is fine despite the overwhelming evidence that it's a catastrophic failure. It, it you know. seems like a lot of people have an intellectual apprehension of the fact, because you can't argue with the fact we are destroying ourselves or certainly at risk of doing so. And when you look at things like obesity and everything we seem to take ownership of, like nutrition, for instance, we seem to do something wrong with it, like uh, sexuality, pornography is causing people problems. Like Everything we commercialise it seems to go downhill. People must have an intellectual apprehension of that, but what I see is they're not emotionally aware of it in an immediate way. They they would really ha some people would really have to meditate hard on this subject to feel um, motivated to do something about it. Because for the most part, we just don't feel motivated. There's, it's the emotional side I think that would push us to act that seems to be missing in a lot of people. Well, yes, and add to that, we've created, increasingly created societal structures that inhibit that. You know, it's all part of the fear that comes from having a rather stupid brain and the world's quite frightening. I think that's what's happened. Um, the way this condition or the, this post-symbiotic process has emerged, you've ended up, because of the hormone variation between males and females, I think basically males on average, get hit hardest with this. It's not a, entirely a male thing, but males get or can be hit hardest with this. And they end up, uh, we can end up with a part of our brain more damaged than average. So it's more frightened. It's more in need of control. And because it's dominant, that's what manifests. Uh, so a lot of people who are driven to take control, typically men, not exclusively, are in many ways the least functional people in society. They're the last people who should be in control and ultimately creating society in their image or at least in the image that they feel comfortable with, yeah. which has got nothing to do with sanity. It's got everything to do with somebody who's effectively got dementia or brain damaged and they're trying to create something that makes them feel good, which yeah. is about perceived control. That's all. Yeah. And for women, um, it's, it's not really control, it's perceived control. <laughs> yeah. Um, for, and and that's, what, that's why I think we've got, I think that's really where the origins of patriarchy come from, the emergence of dominator culture. You know, there's a clue in the title there, or male-dominated culture. Yeah. It's uh, got nothing to do with a social experiment or it works really. It's actually a manifestation of brain damage. Uh, that next and it seems to me that as... Women have recently, uh, you know, we want equality, but we're, n we're not fighting for the right kind of equality, seemingly. We're fighting for to, that we should be allowed into the patriarchy and we should have those jobs and we should do it. And all the while, our female qualities are getting pushed and pushed down to less and less importance. Uh, like I, nannies I are low paid. Clean well, not that we're like just nannies and cleaners and all that, but the, the, the aspects of our psychology that is about nurturing and creating a home and raising children and loving and all these jobs like care jobs they, they mm. see, they're being squashed more and more because our idea of equality as a whole society is that we should be allowed into the patriarchy we should make the whole of society more male yeah yeah it's it's absolutely insane and very unfortunate i think you're right you know the the, the idea that you know the most important job for want of a better word is is to um cultivate it isn't quite right but it's to, is, is, is to be responsible for the next generation to to, yeah. to nurture and build what is this thing between our ears the most complex thing we know it's responsible for every decision we make that's the most important thing we should be focused on make sure that thing works um and and yet as you as you say and i agree and it's very unfortunate um for various reasons the whole equality thing is, is, is like hammering on the door of the asylum, wanting to be in the asylum with all the <laughs> yeah. other fucking idiots. And, and it's like, <laughs> whoa, hang on a minute. No, no, no. It should be the other way. You know, we want to yeah. get the hell away from that. But that's, that, you know, it's, it's like this herd mentality of hurling ourselves off the cliff and who can be fastest off the bloody cliff. You know, it's like absolutely <laughs> crazy. So, so yeah, unfortunately, I've got, I've got every respect for the idea of equality but equality in what you know equality in insanity yeah. or equality in a more sane 
culture. And I think we've got it completely wrong. And I think, you know, a lot of the movements unwittingly have gone chasing after the the, the, the problem, not the solution, you know.